Hello everybody, welcome to the webinar. Today's presentation is Smart Snacks in School, What Colorado Parents Need to Know. And my name is Carol Muller. I am the State Director for Action for Healthy Kids in Colorado. And I'm also a member of the Health, Wellness, and Safety Committee of Colorado PTA. And we are really pleased to bring you this webinar today in partnership with the Colorado Department of Education, Office of School Nutrition, and Livewell, Colorado. So first, before we get started, let me just review some logistics. Uh, once you're linked in, you should see a control panel there on the right side of your screen. Uh, you can use your telephone or your speakers to listen to the presentation, but uh, everybody is muted to avoid static and background interference. So notice that there is a dialog box at the bottom of your control panel. You can type questions into the dialog box as we're going along, and we really encourage you to do that. Uh, we'll try to get to them answered later in the presentation, or if uh, for any reason we don't, uh, we'll shoot you an email following the webinar. We are recording the webinar, so uh, we'll send out links to the recording and any resources that you see uh, put up on the screen. You'll uh, get a copy of the slide deck as well, and uh, we'll get that out to you about two to three business days after the webinar. So today, uh, I'll be presenting along with um, our partners. We have uh, John Padilla, uh, who is a program specialist with the Office of School Nutrition with the Colorado Department of Education. And we have Leslie Levine, who is the Technical Assistance and Research uh, Manager for Libel Colorado. And then uh, my colleague, Denise Marquez, will be fielding questions for us at the end and helping with some of the technology. So today we are going to cover uh, school food regulations. John's going to go over that. And um, each one of us, when we start our presentation, will tell you a little bit about our organization to give you uh, a brief overview. Uh, so John's going to review the regulations governing the school food environment, specifically those covering foods that are sold outside of federally reimbursable meal programs. That includes federal nutrition standards, known as smart snacks, and also state level policies and district wellness policies. Uh, I will then talk about how parent groups can support healthy school food guidelines and extend them to help our students be more successful. And then Leslie will uh, give us an overview about the role of policy in advancing healthy school food. And like I said, we should have time for questions at the end. And so be sure to just uh, make a note of those and type those in as you go along so you don't forget them. So with that said, I am going to turn it over to John. I'll take it away, John. Well, thank you, Carol. Um, as Carol had mentioned, my name is John Padilla. I am a program specialist at the Office of School Nutrition. Um, so basically, the, the Colorado Department of Education um, Office of School Nutrition, we are the state agency that administers the school breakfast program and the national school lunch program. Um, additional programs are like the summer food service program, the after school snack care program, fresh fruit and vegetable program, special milk program. Um, so we administer all those programs um, in the state of Colorado. We also conduct the administrative reviews. These are basically our audits uh, for all school districts in Colorado. So a school district must be reviewed every three years uh, according to USDA regulations. Um, additionally, we provide technical assistance and training opportunities for uh, districts, vendors, uh, stakeholder organizations, um, really anyone that may be, assistant, uh, be able to provide assistance to school districts. Next. Um, so when talking about Colorado competitive food rules, there's really um, three main policies that kind of go into this, uh, or additionally there's, there's a fourth minor one that, that touches on this. So the first one is the Colorado Healthy Beverages Policy. So this one was effective July 1st of 2009. We also have the Colorado Competitive Food Service Policy. This was effective as of July 1998. And then we also have the Federal Smart Snacks in School regulations. This was effective July 1st, 2014, um, with the final rule being effective uh, July 1st, 2016. Additionally, we have the local wellness policy, which was first effective July 1st of 2004, when it was first introduced. Um, and this is an important policy to mention that there are several provisions in it that outline smart snacks and um, foods that are sold to students during the school day. So competitive food, basically a competitive food means all food and beverages other than meals that are reimbursed under the, the school meals program. So any food outside of the National School Lunch Program or the School Breakfast Program, 
that is what we mean when we're talking about a competitive food. Um, and so where local wellness policies come into place with this is that uh, with the final rule, there's standards and nutrition guidelines for foods and beverages that are sold, um, standards that are equal to or stricter than smart snacks. Also, there are standards for foods and beverages provided, not sold. So with these, if you have something as far as birthday celebrations or um, say a Valentine's Day celebration, uh, whatever the district determines, um, that is up to them. Just know that these have to be outlined within the local wellness policy because they're provided, um, not sold. And then also policies for food and beverage marketing. Um, so around this, there is a provision in the local wellness policy final rule that all foods marketed must meet the smart snacks uh, nutrition standards throughout schools. So that's just a, a brief overview of, of some of the wellness policies and how smart snacks fits into that picture. And next slide. So we'll, we will start with smart snacks in schools, kind of detailing that federal regulation. So this applies to all foods and beverages sold to students. So this is defined as on the school campus, during the school day, and outside of the reimbursable meals program. So a school campus is defined as anywhere that the student has access to. School day is defined as midnight up until 30 minutes after the end of the official school day. And then outside of the reimbursable meals program, as we discussed, the national school lunch program and the school breakfast program. So in those little, uh, the, the green box, we say, you know, this includes items sold as a la carte, school stores, snack bars, fundraisers, things like that would be included in this. So what this does not apply to, um, items brought from home or fundraisers that occur outside of the school, birthday classroom celebrations, um, again, that will be outlined in your local wellness policy, or items sold in areas where the students have restricted access. So a perfect example of this is, say, a vending machine in the teacher's lounge. It's on the school campus, but the students do not have access to it. So that would be restricted. That would be not applicable to the smart snack standards. Next. So in order to, to be a smart snack food, first they must meet a general food standard. So with this to be allowable for sale, a food item first needs to meet one of these following standards. It must be a whole grain rich product, or the first ingredient must be a fruit, vegetable, dairy, or protein food. Um, th these food groups may be familiar. These are components actually of the reimbursable meal uh, for like the school breakfast program and the national school lunch program. Um, or another provision is it could be a combination food that contains at least one quarter cup of fruit or vegetable. So an example of this is say pretzels. Um, so the first general food standard they must meet is with this pretzels must be a whole grain rich product. Or another example is say a trail mix. Um, for this the first ingredient would probably be a protein food such as nuts. Next. So the Smart Snacks Nutrient Standards, now that it has met a general standard, here's where we look into the nutrient standards of the food. So you will see in some of these boxes that it, some of them are specific to snack items and then some are specific to entree items. So if you look at the total calories, you'll see a snack item must be less than or equal to 200 calories versus an entree item, which would be less than or equal to 350 calories. Um, so background on the nutrient standards, these are all based on the dietary guidelines for Americans. That's where we get the, you know, the science, the evidence to, to recommend these kind of nutrient standards. So here we have total calories, fats, which must be, must be less than 35% of calories from total fat. We have the saturated fat, less than 10% 10 10 of calories from saturated fat. And then of course the trans fat, or there must be zero grams of trans fat. So that is, again, consistent with the dietary guidelines for Americans. Um, as sodium, we do have the, the variations for snack and entree items, and then as well as sugar, uh, less than or equal to 35% of weight from total sugars in foods. Next. So now we will go into the Colorado Healthy Beverage Policy. So the Colorado Healthy Beverage Policy is a state-specific policy. So whenever you have uh, conflicting like federal regulation or state regulation, you must follow whatever is the stricter of the two. So on November 14th of last year, 2016, 
the Colorado Healthy Beverage Policy was aligned with the federal Smart Snacks Nutrition Standards. Um, so brief background, uh, there was a lot of different policies to follow. Um, for example, we calculated there were about 21 different differing ones between federal and state. So in an effort to streamline things, we uh, the CDE Board of Education voted to align the, the healthy beverage policy with the Smart Snacks Nutrition Standards. Um, so within this alignment, um, that first bullet point says the extended school day. So this was written in state statute. So unfortunately, this this part still remains in effect. Um, so there is that little provision where beverages must meet Smart Snacks nutrition standards throughout the extended school day, and that's defined as after school activities, um, you know, band practices, track practices. Uh, these standards do not apply to after school related events where parents are a significant part of the audience. So an example of this would be like a football game or any kind of game where parents are attending. In, in that scenario, then the these uh, you would not have to meet the, the beverage standards during the extended school day. Next. Here we have the Colorado Competitive Food Service Policy. So competitive foods, they may not be sold in competition with the district's food service program. So this is a, a Colorado specific regulation. USDA always outlines or, or alludes to competitive foods and policies, but they do leave that up to the state discretion. So this one was established, um, I think 2008. So with this, uh, a competitive food cannot be sold 30 minutes before, during, or up into 30 minutes after each scheduled meal service. So this is important to keep in mind if, if your school operates the school breakfast program or if they do both, the national school lunch program and the school breakfast program, um, keep in mind that competitive foods, that policy will apply to those programs. Next. So for food fundraisers, this was a provision in the final role of federal, the federal Smart Snacks regulation. So they left up to each state how many different fundraisers or, or a limit on fundraisers that can be exempt from the Smart Snacks Nutrition Standards. So in Colorado, each school building can have up to three exempt fundraisers. And so these are fundraisers that do not need to meet the Smart Snack Nutrition Standards. An important point to note on this, so this is exempt from Smart Snack Nutrition Standards. This is not an exemption from the Competitive Food Service Policy. So any exempt fundraiser still needs to operate outside of the competitive food service uh, policy, those times designated. Um, the duration of the fundraiser, it's left up, left up to the local discretion, but it must be in line with the intent of the rule. So the intent of the rule states that fundraisers must be infrequent. So a fundraiser that happens every day, every week, that would not be infrequent, and so that would be against the intent of the role and therefore not compliant with the Smart Snack regulation. Also, Smart Snack standards, they do not apply to fundraisers in which the food is intended to be consumed outside of the school campus or not during the school day. Uh, an example of this is like a jar of honey that's being sold. I mean, you, you could eat the jar of honey during the school day, but it wasn't intended for that. Or another common example is like, butter braids, they're frozen, they need to be cooked outside of school. So anything that is intended to be eaten outside of school, um, Smart Snack standards do not apply to this. Next. So here we have a few quick tools and resources that, that have come about. Um, the first one is a Smart Snacks and Competitive Foods Guide. This is a CDE uh, resource that we put together. Like I mentioned before, there were so many different policies that went into place. Um, so this one is one document that combines them all. It combines the different grade levels. It combines the competitive foods guideline. It also combines the, the Colorado Healthy Beverage Policy. So it outlines all of those three policies into one easy to use document. The next one is the Smart Snacks Smart Food Planner. So this is a really neat um, tool provided by the Alliance for a Healthier Generation. So with this, you can actually take your product, you can go online, and you can plug in the nutrition information, such as these are the grams of fat in it, these are the total calories. Um, and then at the end of this, you 
click submit and it will actually give you feedback like yes my product is smart snack compliant or no it isn't smart snack compliant and then next under the same um, organization is the smart snacks product navigator so with this there is actually a, a part on their website where you you can open up um, different food groups or different beverages or snack types and you can actually see products that are approved smart snacks approved so that makes you know buying food products a little bit easier for the school districts next we have documentation requirements so each entity that's selling these food and beverages they must keep records of all items that are sold and then the districts in addition to this must maintain the documentation of the three exempt fundraiser limit so with this we do have a few resources we put together um, on our website so the example of the food and beverage sales documentation tracker these are basically just uh, you know spreadsheets that you can indicate the type of fundraisers was this one of your exempt ones was it not um, really easy to use uh, in addition on our, our website we also have the free resources such as the USDA super tracker so this is a, a nu nutrient calculator where you can plug in all of the nutrient information and, and record it in that way so next we do have the different responsibilities of the district so within this this is important to distinguish the district and the school food service so this comes into play with competitive foods so if, for example we discussed that with under the competitive foods regulation anything that's separate from the the national school lunch program or the school breakfast program those are considered competitive foods so and speaking of competitive foods so even a, a school store fundraiser uh, vending machines those are all considered competitive foods if they do not operate or, or if 100 percent of the profits do not go into the school food service account so with this um, really we like to see a, a whole collaboration with the whole district administrators principals teachers that way it's easy to document you know fundraisers and a la carte sales so that way since smart snack kind of goes a little beyond school food service to include some of these other areas it, it really helps to to streamline that effort and get a lot of the, the school district on board too because fundraisers or vending machines oftentimes we we find that the school food service doesn't know exactly who operates it so this is where the district will come into play to kind of just to help help the school food service regulate if these products are indeed smart snack compliant yeah, and lastly um, I just wanted to talk about the administrative review so this is our audit that we conduct every three years for a school district um, so basically what the review covers is all aspects of food service so we look at mill counting and claiming this is basically the you're checking off that the student ate and you're going to count them to get reimbursement from the government so that's what that area kind of oversees mill patterns because there are specific nutrition standards um, that must be met with the mill patterns that are in the national school lunch and school breakfast program similarly with all of them the snack program fresh fruit and vegetable program the local wellness policy as we discussed um, there are certain smart snacks provisions within the local wellness policy and so with this during our administrative review we we go through the, the local wellness policy just to ensure that it contains all requirements um, we also look at different aspects of it too um, so school districts are required to have uh, parents be able to um, help out with the, the development of the local wellness policy or as far as the assessment of it um, school districts must allow students or really any stakeholder that could be involved so this is a great area for you to have an impact on your school district and and some of the, the food choices that are being served there uh, food safety we cover smart snacks we also cover as well so with smart snacks since this is kind of the topic area we we conduct a, a 10 percent sample of all foods that are considered smart snacks um, and from there we take a look at the nutrient requirements um, we look at documentation as, as far as fundraisers uh, and then there's also a lot more aspects of the administrative review we cover such as training standards food safety things like that um, so for smart snacks practices um, a sample of the smart snacks foods and fundraisers those are all assessed for compliance so we look at all those records um, that we mentioned all the tracking these are my exempt these are my non-exempt fundraisers we do take a look at all those 
And with that, I will turn it back over to Carol. <clears throat> great. Thank you so much, John. Uh, really appreciate all that um, great information, a, a lot of which I didn't know before either, even though I've been doing this for a while. So um, let's move on and uh, talk about implementing healthy school food standards and really what the role of parents is in that. So I'm presenting today on behalf of both Action for Healthy Kids and Colorado PTA. Our organizations work really closely together to bring school wellness resources uh, to parents and parent groups. And so just a little bit about who we are. Uh, Action for Healthy Kids is a national nonprofit. We fight childhood obesity, undernourishment, and physical inactivity by helping schools become healthier places. And we work at, at multiple levels, uh, the federal level, state level, and in school districts and school buildings across the country. We offer free programs and resources and grants to schools to expand breakfast programs and to implement other nutrition and physical activity initiatives because uh, those are our two focus areas. And a little bit later, I will just uh, talk really briefly about some of those resources that might be of interest to uh, parents and audience. And then PTA. So nationally, PTA is the oldest and largest child advocacy organization in the U.S. with more than 4 million members and uh, close to 20,000 of those are in, are in Colorado. Now m many people don't know that uh, PTA was not organized to raise money for schools. It was organized uh, to speak on behalf of children and youth in schools, in the community, and before government bodies. Uh, it was organized to assist parents in developing the skills they need to raise and protect their kids, and also to encourage parent and public involvement in the public school system. And it's because of PTA that we have Universal Kindergarten, the National School Lunch Program, and a juvenile justice system. So I really encourage, if you're not part of a PTA to school, uh, to learn more about Colorado PTA, the state association, and to learn about the advantages of becoming either an individual member or uh, of your parent group becoming uh, a member organization, I encourage you to visit the Colorado PTA website and, and learn more. So the role of parent groups in the implementation of smart snacks and other school food standards. Uh, let's take a look at some of the research to start with. So this is a poll that was taken by the Pew Charitable Trust, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the American Heart Association uh, pretty recently in 2014. And it showed that 72% of parents support standards for school snacks. And most parents hold a mixed or, or even a negative opinion of the nutritional quality of snack foods and beverages that uh, traditionally have been sold in schools. And many parents, most parents, the majority were concerned about these issues. So food service directors and staff uh, really do need parents and PTO, PTA partners to help implement these standards successfully. Uh, really simply put, parent groups are vital partners in this effort. The guidelines offer parent groups the opportunity to play a key role in a broader, more comprehensive healthy school food program. And a food service staff need parent groups to do more than just making sure their own activities are in compliance. They really need parents to be engaged in the issue and to be engaged in the outcomes. Uh, they need help promoting the standards, promoting healthy school food with other parents, with students, teachers, and other school stakeholders, and uh, we'll give some uh, strategies around that shortly. Uh, food service staff need input on how healthier school food programs are working. Uh, often they're looking for recipe ideas and feedback on menu items. Uh, they need help with advocacy efforts. Uh, for example, parents can help advocate for longer lunch lines, uh, or long not longer lunch lines, longer lunch times. Uh, they can help advocate for recess before lunch, cafeteria remodels, and that type of thing. And uh, school leaders are more apt to listen to these types of advocacy if multiple parents are pushing for change in addition to just food service staff. And uh, food service staff need parents to help by making the rest of the school food environment healthy. Uh, Healthy food programs are much more likely to be successful if health is an integral part of the entire school culture. So we're talking today, or you're probably going to hear me refer more to uh, mostly about parent leadership groups in schools, like your PTOs and your PTAs. But just know that the information we provide really could apply, apply to individual parents or, or any groups that intersect with the school food environment, and particularly those that are involved in fundraising with food. Uh, for example, booster clubs that are attached to athletic teams or 
room parents that are helping teachers with fundraisers or, or classroom activities. So to start with, parents groups do need to take it upon themselves to make sure their activities are in compliance with the rules. Uh, check with your nutrition services department to find out who the expert is in your school or district who, who is overseeing the regulations. Uh, it's a good idea to designate someone in your parent group uh, to serve as your Smart Snacks point person, both for other parents or groups at your school and also for school officials that need to get that documentation uh, about your activities. So in addition to the CDE booklet that John pointed out and that um, we give out at our trainings, uh, so really that's a really great booklet. Uh, these are a couple of additional resources. Uh, USDA has a lot of excellent resources to help you navigate through Smart Snacks, uh, including this guide that they just put out in uh, July last summer when the rules were finalized. And then National PTA has a guide for parent organizations too with an overview of the rules and uh, some additional implementation strategies. So I recommend you check both of those out. Uh, and then, uh, as I said, complying with the standards is really just the first step promoting the standards to other groups at your school, uh, that's really where your parent group can, can help make a, school, a healthy school food program successful. Uh, first, you need to understand uh, the benefits so that you can uh, use these as talking points about why the standards are so important. Healthy school food uh, supports classroom lessons. Uh, food policies and practices uh, should really reflect curriculum standards for health and nutrition rather than conflict with them. A healthy school food culture publicly demonstrates a school's commitment to promoting healthy behaviors among its students, uh, among its families and staff, and it really sends the message that health is a top, health is a top priority. Uh, and uh, it also can create excitement about nutrition. When nutritious foods are presented in a fun and engaging way, uh, students are way more eager to get involved. Uh, but most importantly, Study after study shows that healthy school food increases student performance, and so this is something that really should be talked about because that is the mission of a school. So uh, in addition to the benefits, uh, it's a good uh, idea to understand a little bit about the financial implications uh, because uh, there's definitely a concern out there that uh, schools and school stakeholders have that they're going to lose revenue if they switch to healthier foods. So you need to be prepared to address this question. And uh, while some schools do report an initial decrease in revenue, there's a growing body of research and evidence that suggests that schools can have strong standards and still maintain financial stability. Uh, some schools end up making more money as uh, increased sales of school meals can make up for losses from a la carte and vending sales. Uh, the second study that you see uh, in the bottom on, in gray on the slide was conducted by the Illinois Public Health Institute. And uh, it's got some good strategies for maintaining profits. And uh, most of the schools in that study reported that competitive food profits rebounded substantially uh, within two years of implementation. So this is another one. Uh, this is a recent study, a 2000, 2014. It was conducted by Cornell and the University of Iowa. And researchers found that when given the option, 77% of students chose healthier foods when they were made available at uh, school concession stands. They also found that revenue increased when a variety of healthy items were available. So there's more and more evidence uh, showing uh, that you can be financially uh, stable. So here's some uh, strategies that uh, parent groups can use to help with the promotion. Uh, start by communicating that healthy food guidelines are a positive thing, and this is, this is really important. Uh, you know, the standards, they do take extra effort, but the payoff in terms of academic success and good health are well worth the effort, and that should be your message when you're talking about it. Uh, you don't want to act as if they're a painful regulation to implement. Uh, other parents, students, teachers uh, are going to take their cue from your attitude when you're talking about them. You want to market, the, the market healthier snacks with positive and fun nutrition messages. Place healthier products front and center and price them more competitively than less nutritious items. Uh, conduct taste tests to introduce students to new menu items and find out which, which items appeal to more students. And uh, taste tests are really a great way for parents to help food service staff. Uh, conducting student focus groups is another strategy to gather their input about the program uh, and see if you can find some to sign on as healthy school food ambassadors to help spread the message in their peer groups. We all know that uh, uh, 
uh, kids listen uh, more to their peers than they do to adults, so it's great to have them um, on your side. Uh, and then educating parents and families on nutrition to increase support for healthier food choices. Host a parent ed night around nutrition or start a family cooking class. Uh, even just sending home flyers asking parents to reinforce nutrition messages at home can be helpful. So kids are going to be more excited about good nutrition if their cafeteria environment is appealing. How about a new coat of paint, uh, murals, posters, better lighting? All these things can make them feel more positive about good nutrition. Uh, we want to encourage staff, teachers, and volunteers to model healthy snacking and talk about how they feel better and stronger uh, when they're eating uh, more nutritious things. And then what's available in your communities to support your efforts? Uh, there could be programs going on elsewhere in your district that you could bring into your school. Uh, you can ask your nutrition services department or at the district level or your healthy schools team. Uh, you can also try to connect with community partners to help you uh, promote healthy initiatives. So this is an example of an Action for Healthy Kids school in Washington and what um, that student council in that school did to bring their school store into compliance. Uh, the students, uh, this was just a few weeks I think before the, the, um, the standards went into effect and so they kind of got to work and had a, developed a whole project. Uh, they identified acceptable products using um, the product calculator that John mentioned earlier from the Alliance for a Healthier Generation. Uh, they used Action for Healthy Kids grant funds to purchase uh, display cases and signs, and they placed healthier items at the front of the display case at lower prices. They also hosted sampling events, and they advertised the new products in a variety of ways. And uh, they ended up increasing their profits by $120 in the first few weeks. And uh, the adult advisors that work with the student council uh, said that the key element to make the whole project successful really was engaging students in choosing the products and the pricing and developing the marketing materials. Uh, and this is really uh, important. It helped develop a strong sense of student buy-in, uh, gave them ownership over the project, and uh, really helped to make it successful. So this was a student council, but um, parent groups really can play an important role in sharing these types of activities and these examples and success stories and these strategies with student councils and booster clubs and really anyone in their school that might be doing, having a similar type of food sale. So let's go beyond the regulations. Uh, it's a really important for uh, food service, uh, to show our food service staff and personnel that we're all in this together and establishing those healthy school food practices school-wide uh, can go a long way and it's a place where parents can really, really make a difference. Uh, for example, starting with healthy fundraising. Uh, so many fundraising activities don't involve selling food for immediate consumption. As John said, the smart snacks uh, regulations just cover those foods that are intended to be eaten on the spot. So many fundraising activities don't fall under the guidelines. You've got your chocolate bars, cookie dough, etc. Uh, but the good news is there are more and more companies out there that offer non-food or healthy food fundraising options and it's becoming clear that they can generate profits for schools that are equal to or even sometimes greater than profits from fundraisers that are selling those un unhealthy foods. So look at the examples there uh, on, the on the slide in the table. Uh, and we have lots of other ideas on our website both for healthy food and non-food fundraisers. Uh, we really feel that active fundraisers are the best way to go. Uh, runs or tournaments, teacher-student competitions are popular, uh, how about a jump rope-a-thon or a dance-a-thon. Uh, we worked with a school in Ohio that hosted a hippity hop -a -thon, and that was really fun. It's also just fun to say the name, not get your tongue twisted. Uh, so let's move on to celebrations. Uh, this definitely is, is a uh, part that parents play a large role in at school. For birthdays, there are so many different ways to make a birthday child feel special without serving unhealthy treats. Uh, being the teacher's helper, having special activity time with an adult, uh, letting the birthday child choose a game or activity for the class to do. And, and if parents do want to bring in something for their kid's birthday, ask them to donate a favorite book to the classroom library instead of bringing in treats. If that's not economically feasible for your families, uh, you can just have the birthday child pick a book from the classroom library for the teacher to read. 
even switching to a monthly party would help to cut down on the amount of unhealthy food in the classroom. And uh, remember, you just don't have to have food at every celebration. So some schools are making it really easy for their parents to offer healthier party treats. Uh, Lowry Elementary in Denver has a healthy cupcake program. Uh, the cafeteria and uh, the food service department bakes and decorates sweet potato muffins on request from parents for classroom parties. Uh, they've given them a special name called Thor Cupcakes, and uh, they cost under $10 to serve an average classroom. So that is not much uh, different or probably about the same as it would cost to go buy you know, three of those packages of, of really sugary frosted cookies uh, at the grocery store. Okay, for holiday parties and other celebrations, again, remember, you don't always have to have food. You can give children extra recess time instead of a party. Uh, have a dance party. Invite the principal and other school staff. Uh, it's important to get the students involved, again, in planning and preparing for the celebration. Let them make the decorations. Let them choose what the games are. Uh, children like adventure, so don't be afraid to try something new. Again, uh, Game On, our uh, signature program, has lots of great tips and healthy party ideas for specific holidays like Valentine's Day or Halloween. It's also got some healthy recipes. So family events. So um, you just really want to think about health and promoting a healthy lifestyle when you're planning your family events. If you, if you uh, plan events that get parents engaged and on board with healthy living, this is going to create more buy-in for a healthy school food culture and uh, really make it more likely that healthy habits will be reinforced at home. And when food is part of a celebration or an event, you want to put the healthy items front and center like we uh, talked about before with the um, student council store. Offer a variety of healthy options. Arrange your fruits and vegetables in a visually appealing way. Uh, offer sweets in small portion sizes. You can try cutting them in half. And always uh, make water the beverage of choice. You want to put it center stage. Uh, think about uh, creating sign-up sheets that list healthy items or send home a list of suggestions for healthy party snacks. And uh, don't forget to always pay attention to food allergies and special diet needs. So let's talk about rewards. Uh, rewards are offered throughout the school by lots of different school stakeholders to kids. Uh, children's health experts recommend non-food rewards as a best practice. Uh, providing any kind of food, whether it's healthy or unhealthy, uh, based on performance or behavior can teach kids to eat when they're not hungry. And that uh, really sets the stage for unhealthy habits uh, that can last a lifetime. Uh, if you want to start a school-wide healthy rewards initiative, I think about giving a presentation about healthy rewards at a staff meeting and then asking teachers to take a no food is reward pledge. Recognize teachers who follow through on that pledge and uh, it's also possible for uh, uh, you to provide trinkets and prizes for teachers to use with donations or with PTO or PTA funds. But uh, kids don't always need material, material rewards. Recognition by itself is a really powerful reward whether it's a public announcement, a phone call, or a note to parents, uh, can be a certificate achievement, or, or even really just a simple pat on the back. Uh, remember that uh, teachers and school staff aren't the only ones rewarding students. Make sure that anything given out by your parent group also sends a consistent health message. Avoid rewards centered on unhealthy eating, like uh, the pancake party you can see on the slide that uh, is given as a reward for uh, the class who has the best screen-free a weak record. So those things aren't real consistent. And again, Action for Healthy Kids has lots of ideas for healthy rewards on our website. So not all snack programs involve food sales. Uh, kids uh, bring snacks from home or they might be provided for kids through donations or through grant funds. Uh, but regardless of where they come from, they represent an opportunity to promote good nutrition using the same strategies that we talked about earlier. Role modeling, fun nutrition messages and taste tests. Uh, see if the school can put a big fruit bowl instead of a candy bowl in the front office and make it available for staff, students, and parents to help themselves. Uh, you can brainstorm ways to keep it full. Uh, donations from stores or PTO funds or donations from families. Uh, something like this, this is a really small effort and it sends a strong message to anybody entering the office that this is a school that really uh, values healthy eating. Okay, and um, 
access to drinking water. So this is really, really important. Uh, you want to make sure you want to make sure that your uh, water fountains are clean, that they're properly maintained, and you want to make sure that um, they are in, in good places throughout the school. Uh, some of the schools we work with have used uh, grant funds to install water bottle filling stations, and these are really popular with kids and tend to get them to drink more water. Uh, um, also, allowing them to have water bottles in the class and to go to the water fountain if they need to uh, is a great school policy to have. And so, um, with that said, I just want to mention a few resources before I turn it over to Leslie. Uh, we have some, um, we have a great program I've mentioned a couple times. It's called Game On. It's our multi-year school wellness framework for K through 12 schools. And the great thing about it is it's got over eight different uh, eat better and move more activities that you can check into that are all sorts of resources, particularly, uh, and many that are related to what we've talked about, like fundraising, school snacks, nutrition messages, healthy rewards, and that type of thing. Uh, so definitely check that out. Uh, we also have some grants out uh, now, some application that's out for our uh, breakfast programs for next year, and also um, to implement Game On activities. So again, we'll send these links out in the follow-up email so you can um, learn more about them. And for parent groups in particular, we, uh, in partnership with Colorado PTA, we are offering a wellness equipment kit to school districts in uh, selected districts in Colorado. Uh, schools have to be at the 40% free and reduced level or higher. And uh, the school parent groups uh, can be either PTOs or PTAs, or uh, could be a school wellness team that is working with parent leaders uh, as long as um, there are parents in the group and it's in an eligible district, in an eligible school, uh, you can apply for any one of the wellness kits uh, that you see at the bottom of the screen there to implement um, activities. And the application deadline for that is April 20th. And then finally, just uh, you can find more ideas and more resources on our Facebook page, both uh, the Colorado Action for Healthy Kids page and the Colorado PTA page. And so with that, then I am going to turn it over to Leslie. Go ahead, Leslie, take it away. Thank you, Carol. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today about the challenges of copycat snacks and how to address this challenge through policy change. Um, if you can go ahead and switch the next, to the next slide. Um, I'd first like to start by sharing just a little bit about Live Well Colorado. We are a statewide nonprofit organization that was established back in 2009. Our organization addresses the barriers to healthy eating and active living, especially in low-income communities and communities of color through policy change at the local, state, and the federal level. One of our areas of focus is access to healthy foods in schools, and specifically in the school meal program. So this program is called the Live Well at School Food Initiative. And we work in partnership with school districts across Colorado to empower nutrition services staff to provide school meals that are nutritious and delicious. The districts enrolled in this program receive culinary, operations, and marketing training over the course of 18 months. So, for example, our unique marketing assistance helps food nutrition service departments promote the positive changes that they're making to the greater school community. Next. Um, as I mentioned, the Live Well Colorado approach is to work through policy change. And policy work doesn't follow one specific process or one specific template. Most important is to take the time to assess the assets and the challenges at the school and the district to begin to devise your strategy for changing policy. Take the time to consider if passing a policy will be most effective through a top-down approach, say through the Board of Education, the district superintendent or a school principal. And you also might consider if the students, the parents, classroom staff, or other school staff are really needed to rally um, together to demonstrate that there's a need for change. So understanding how policy is successfully passed in areas outside of, of food or wellness activities could be really helpful in making the decision about how to uh, address policy change in your community. Um, you also need to determine the scope of your policy. You know, do you want to start small and make a change at the classroom level to build momentum and support and make the case for what's possible? Or does the, po the policy need to be changed at the, the school level or the district level? 
And really considering your champions is a great way to determine which level of policy is best for you to approach. So if you look at the slide, I have a variety of, of possible policy champions. So Carol was talking about birthday celebrations and finding a teacher who's really passionate about this issue could be a great way to start classrooms looking at how often are they doing those celebrations. Obviously, you as parents um, are the great champion as well. Um, and you might have parents assigned to each grade level who are helping to set the rules for what do classroom snacks look like on a daily basis. We know a lot of kindergartens rely on parents to provide snacks for all of the students on a daily basis. Um, your principal um, might be a huge champion for making sure that healthy snacks are available on testing days. So start there and then foster uh, building that champion of your principal to consider the snacks that are served during the rest of the school year. You might not think about your front office staff as being a champion, but building that champion in the, in the couple of staff that are the, the very first people that you see when you walk in the building, those are the folks who are monitoring what comes and goes in the building. So if you can find a champion in your front office staff, that's really, really important for compliance of policies that you're setting at your school. And then lastly, don't forget about your school nurse. They can be a great champion because they have access to a lot of data, especially when we talk about what kind of allergies do students have and are they seeing a lot of students come in with tummy aches in the morning, whether they're hungry or whether um, they aren't feeling good from eating um, some, a lot of sugar-loaded foods at the beginning of the day. Next. So I want to shift the conversation now to a topic called copycat snacks. An unanticipated change has taken place in our cafeterias that has caused alarm among parents and public health advocates. So unfortunately, in response to the smart snacks reg regulations, some snack food manufacturers reformulated their existing products to meet the smart snacks nutrition standards. These new products have less fat and sodium, have no saturated fat, and they come in smaller serving sizes to meet the calorie requirements. Additionally, whole grains are being added to typically nutrient-poor products to meet the whole grain requirement. The packaging for these snacks is slightly different, but almost an unnoticeable change from the original package. So unfortunately, what has resulted is an optimal marketing and branding opportunity for food and beverage manufacturers. The products, some of the products, I should say, sold in schools have been reformulated to meet stricter nutrition standards, however, these products aren't available in grocery stores or convenience stores or other food retail settings. These changes have taken us far from the intent of the Smart Snacks Nutrition Guidelines, which is to provide a healthier variety of snacks for sale during school hours. Now we see in cafeterias in Colorado and across the nation, um, cafeterias that are full of overly processed, fortified junk food with the impression that they're healthy because they're Smart Snacks compliant. Additionally, when schools are making an effort to provide nutrition education in classrooms, or as Carol talked about, the different efforts that parents um, can do through their wellness programs to provide nutrition education, the students are now receiving conflicting messages between what they see in classrooms and what they see in the cafeteria. It's important to be aware that the presence of these copycat snacks increases the competition that food service directors face when children who have the option to purchase school food instead are choosing to purchase the copycat snacks. Next. There was recently an article published, it was in August of 2016, in the Childhood Obesity Journal, and it looked at the impacts of copycat snacks. So the researchers specifically studied the impact on attitudes of students regarding the healthfulness of these products and the student's intention to purchase them. They looked at whether or not copycat snacks cause confusion for both parents and for students about the differences between the products that are sold in schools and the products that are sold in stores. And then lastly, they studied what impact these copycat snacks have on feelings that schools aren't concerned with the health of their students. So for the study, they split participants into four different groups. So the first group saw the look-alike smart snacks, what I've been calling copycat snacks. The second group saw school snacks and packaging that was visibly different from what is sold in stores. I will call these snacks the modified snacks. 
and the third group only saw the store version. And then lastly, that fourth group saw snacks that meet Smart Snack guidelines without being altered, and I will call those the unaltered snacks. The attitudes about the healthfulness of the products differed among the four groups. Both parents and students rated the unaltered snacks as significantly healthier than the other three groups. They rated modified snacks as healthier than both store and copycat versions. In addition, the parents, but not the students, rated the copycat snacks as significantly healthier than store versions of the snacks. In terms of the impact on intention to purchase the snacks, which is something that will be of concern to food service directors who do sometimes look to the sales of snacks to help balance their school food budget, they saw that parents indicated that their children would like to taste and would buy the unaltered products significantly less than the snacks in the other three categories. Students believed that they would like the taste of unaltered products less than the other products and that they would like the modified snacks significantly less than either the copycat or the store version of the same snack brands. And then students were more likely to have purchased the store versions than the unaltered snacks. So as hypothesized, the students and the parents rated the copycat and store versions similarly in taste healthfulness and purchase intent while considering the modified snacks as healthier but less tasty. Most of the participants also inaccurately believed that they saw the copycat products for sale in stores. And then furthermore, they rated the schools offering copycat snacks and store versions as less concerned about the students' health and well-being than the schools in the other two conditions. So I fully admit that that's a lot of information and it can be a bit complex, so I, I definitely encourage you to seek out the Childhood Obesity Journal article, and I'm happy to share that with Carol um, when we send out um, the slides at the, after the webinar is over. Next. So I'd like to end my presentation by reminding you that Smart Snacks guidelines are a baseline or a minimum threshold. Parents and wellness proponents can advocate for stronger policies at the state, district, and school levels. Change Lab Solutions is a national organization that provides assistance through toolkits, how-to guides, fact sheets, and model policy language on a number of issues related to preventable disease. And I just learned last week that they will be releasing some model policy language that prohibits the sale of copycat snacks. So we will um, definitely be distributing that when it is available. Lastly, if you're interested in keeping updated on federal policy action that could impact the federal school meal program, you can sign up for alerts on the Live Well Colorado website. One way that you can help with these advocacy efforts is letting me or any of the speakers today know how Smart Snacks is working in your school or working in your district. Um, my com uh, contact information is available on that last slide, and thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Great. Thank you so much, Leslie. Um, that's all really, really interesting about the copycat snacks, so uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, I am going to turn it over to Denise now. Uh, Denise, do we have any questions? Yes, thank you, Carol. Um, we have a few questions that have come in, and I just want to remind you if you have any questions that you thought of um, while listening to our speakers today, you still have some time to um, put them in the question dialog box. And if we don't have enough time to answer your questions, we will definitely get back to you after the webinar today. Um, so the first question that came up, uh, maybe Jonathan, you can answer this. Um, we're setting up a food bank for kids to get free healthy snacks during the school day. Um, where can parents purchase foods that fall within the guidelines? Um, we want to send a consistent message, but it's hard to find a variety of snacks that are compliant at Costco or at other stores. Um, yes, this can kind of be a little bit difficult, kind of like Leslie mentioned, um, that these 
main products were reformulated to meet the school nutrition standards. So unfortunately at those big, you know, Costco's or other stores, um, it will be the same manufacturer, but the nutrition standards will be a little bit different. Um, as far as vendors, unfortunately, when we work for the school districts, they have big vendors such as U.S. Foods and Cisco's. So that's where they buy a lot of their food products. Um, my, my best recommendation with some of these is kind of going back to the basic products. You know, your basic foods are, are going to be more likely to meet those nutrition standards than a, you know, a package product um, just because of some of that reformulation. Okay. Um, can I, let me ask you, John, this is Carol. Um, so is it, do you know of school district nutrition services, cafeteria managers, and current groups working together to purchase things? Would that be a possibility to actually partner with your food service to buy, you know, snacks that are compliant if they have more access to them? I mean, not, not that we would recommend buying look-alike snacks. I mean, I think we would definitely not recommend that, but there may be others that are not look-alike. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's an that's a option that is definitely viable. Um, and also it would be a good one because your, your school district has a bigger purchasing power, so they can buy some of those snacks at oftentimes a cheaper rate than, than someone just coming in and wanting to buy them. So that's definitely an option too. Um, and your school food service would separate those purchases from their um, school food service account, so they can do that. Okay. And then another thing, just to remind you guys, that uh, John mentioned a couple of tools uh, from the Alliance for a Healthier Generation. There's one where you can plug in your snacks and see if they are compliant. And then there's also um, where you can browse for compliant snacks. So, I mean, I'm not sure if when you browse, they only are showing snacks that, you know, the big vendors, the, the, um, the wholesale vendors offer or not, but um, I would think that there's probably some you can find in stores as well. So you should check and I'd also out. like to add that um, you can also reach out to your local food banks or food pantries if you don't have to only have shelf-stable products. Um, you might be able to work with your local food pantry to get some donations of fresh fruits or some dairy products that would meet um, the Smart Snacks guidelines. Those are all one great. Final, oh, oh, sorry, yeah, one final ahead. add to this, um, and, and looking at the question too, so Smart Snacks again uh, goes to foods that are sold to students. So if, um, I believe in the question said the parents are purchasing this food, so if they are given away as healthy snacks during the day, so in that scenario those wouldn't have to meet Smart Snacks standards because they are given to students provided um, not sold. Okay, great. Um, it looks like we only have one more minute, so I'm just going to ask uh, one more question here. Um, so what happens to a school if they are reported for not being compliant with Smart Snacks or the competitive foods rule? Um, should I report my school if they're not following the guidelines? For this one, um Usually for reporting, it's, it's best just to work with the food service department first. Um, oftentimes it could be a miscommunication or um, really looking at their, their aspects first. Um, like I mentioned, federal and state regulations, the stricter has to be followed. So, for example, if a district puts a stricter regulation than, than the state or federal, then that one must be followed. So really the, the school food service department is going to know your district regulations the best out of anyone. Um, and of course they can have the biggest impact. So definitely work with your school food service um, first to, to kind of resolve any issues. If they are reported to us, we basically try to do what we call technical assistance. This is providing resources, recommendations, um, kind of best practices. Maybe we will get them in contact with another school district that is possibly doing really well at this scenario, um, pass that contact information along. Um, our first result is really try to help them uh, meet the federal and state regulations. All right, great. Thanks, Jonathan. And um, mm -hmm. Carol? Yes. Well, great. Um, well, as Denise said, we, if, you, if there were other questions out there we didn't get to, then we will uh, respond to you via email. I just want to quickly point out another great opportunity to promote healthy school food, and that is Every Kid Healthy Week, which is coming up the last week of April. Uh, this is an annual national celebration of school wellness achievements, and it's recognized on the National Health Observance Calendar. 
uh, any event that you have going on that takes place the last week of April or really any time in April or early May could be registered as an Every Kid Healthy event and will help to build momentum around uh, school health and wellness. And last year we had more than 1,600 schools across the country host events and we'd love to get a lot, of, a lot more uh, happening this year in Colorado. And um, our partners, our state partners uh, for Every Kid Healthy Week uh, this year in Colorado are uh, Live Well and Action for Healthy Kids, Colorado PTA, and the Western Dairy Association. So we'll send out a link so you can check that out too. And that said, um, you'll get all of our emails. Feel free to, to reach out to us if you have any additional questions. Uh, I just want to thank uh, John and Leslie again for being with us today. We really appreciate your time and all the great information. And uh, especially you out there in the audience, we really appreciate your interest in the topic and wish you all the best of luck with your wellness endeavors. So thank you very much and have a great afternoon.